My name is John Massey. In 1975, I took the life of a club bouncer. Life for me in 75 is pretty good. But on that fatal night, me and my pal were buying drinks and enjoying ourselves. Before you know, you're in the blink of an eye, it's kicked off the old saloon bar brawl, you know. With the anger and the rage being at its peak, we decided to arm ourselves and go back. We wanted to hurt them, yeah. And the bouncer answered the door. I met him with a gun, get back inside. I thought he was gonna throw me a punch. And I pulled the trigger. Murder is the ultimate crime. Punishable by life in prison, or in some countries, execution. But scientists are beginning to understand how biological, psychological, and social factors can combine to make someone more likely to kill. Their findings are set to change our perception of crime and punishment forever. Now, for the first time, Convicted murderers submit themselves to a groundbreaking investigation as two criminal experts hunt for the causes of their crimes. Did they really have control over their actions? Or did hidden factors mean they were always destined to kill? Maybe I'm not the uh, psychopath or ogre that they painted me out to be. I'm as curious as you are to find out. In a remote location on the south coast of England, two criminal experts are preparing to meet a convicted killer. This is John Massey. Mm -hmm. Convicted of murder in 1976. A three-quarter length shotgun. Professor Adrian Rain is a pioneering criminologist. The witness says he saw my... He spent 42 years looking for the causes of crime in the brains, hormones and genes of convicted killers. I've studied murderers in Europe, Africa, China, United States, and I found common biological characteristics that predispose them to committing murder. His controversial research could be used to predict criminal behavior and to question the culpability of thousands already in prison. If you've got low resting heart rate, you are 39% more likely to grow up to become a violent criminal offender. People with traumatic brain injury are four times more likely to end up in prison. The more biological risk factors you have, the more likely you will become violent. Adrian is now teaming up with forensic psychologist, Dr. Vicky Thakordas Desai. The judge describes him as a cold-blooded, premeditated murderer. She spent 20 years working in prisons, analyzing Britain's most violent offenders, and is an expert in how life experiences can shape behavior. Having interviewed hundreds of offenders, including murderers, there are common factors that are present throughout a lot of their histories. Trauma, abuse, neglect, by combining psychological and biological risk factors, we're hoping that we'll be able to gain a deeper understanding of what leads someone to commit murder. Together, Vicky and Adrian are going to search for clues in the body and mind of Britain's longest serving murderer, John Massey. When we have biological risk factors that stack up with social risk factors like abuse, that toxic mix makes the murderer. 
Did John have control over his actions? Or could hidden factors have shaped his fate? So John, you have this label of a murderer. How does that feel for you? I'm quite resentful of that label. But not only have they labelled me a murderer, but they labelled me a premeditated, cold-blooded murderer. Because in a courtroom trial, they made a big thing, well, you stepped over this man's cold, lifeless body. I mean, he couldn't have even been cold, could he? During this investigation, we're going to go on this journey with you and really try to understand what factors may have led to you committing the act of murder. What if we discovered something that was uncomfortable? If it's there, it's there. I've got to live with it. A man lost his life. I was responsible for that. But the actual word murder was never in my consciousness. So I'm curious to uh, see the end result. It may lead to a little better understanding of why I did what I did. On the 24th of September, 1975, career criminal John Massey shot pub bouncer Charlie Higgins at point blank range with a sawn-off shotgun. He then stepped over his body before releasing five more rounds in the bar. That year, there were 508 murders in England and Wales, including more gun-related killings than at any other point that decade. John served the next 43 years of his life behind bars. Whilst we may have disagreements with other people from time to time, we're not going to go and arm ourselves with a gun and go back and shoot them. In my experience, there is always a sequence of events. The question for me is, what was the chain reaction that led John to kill? To begin the investigation, Vicky is going to conduct a psychological interview with John. Having read his case file, she now wants to analyze how John describes his own behavior in the run-up to the murder. So I'd like to start before the murder. That evening, what were you doing? We were uh, on a bit of a pub crawl. Okay. Yeah. And we ended up at this late night venue. It's called the Cricketers. The pub up the top of the club down the below. The drinks were flowing freely and it just suddenly kicked off. I probably started it off because the game, like, guy was wagging his finger, and I think I just slammed my drink over it. Okay. And we got a few knocks and bangs, but we fought our way to the door and managed to get out. It was only when we was halfway up the stairs that we heard these blood curdling screams, and uh, my friend realised it was his pal still in there with his girlfriend. So we had to fight our way back into the club and drag him out. He'd been smashed into the face with a broken beer glass. And his eye was literally hanging on his face like a sliced onion. What was bubbling away inside of you? That he bunch of pricks thought they could um, use brute force on us. Mm. We wanted to bring them back down to earth. We took two handguns and two shotguns. The 
bouncer answered the door. I was pressed the gun up his chest and said, get back inside. But for some unimaginable reason, the guy thought he's more powerful than a gun. Because the gun was levelled at his chest, that's where he got hit. Was the victim, was he involved in the actual he, role earlier? A, he was the bouncer. So then does that make it harder to fully accept responsibility for yeah. what happened? Yeah. You know, he has to take on his own responsibilities. The judge described John as a premeditated, cold-blooded murderer. But actually, as we dig deeper, it's more complex than that. He described feeling angry. I'm interested in finding out what happened in his past and what's going on in his biology that made him react in the way that he did. His offence, as he described, was a very callous one. And there was a real sort of lack of fear, not feeling, you know, any sort of concern or worry. That gets me intrigued about doing some brain scanning on him. Mm. And just wonder whether there's any structural impairment there that could be very helpful to us in trying to work John out. Professor Rain is taking John to a world-leading research facility to scan his brain. He wants to search for abnormalities that might explain the behavior Vicky has uncovered. The brain is a fascinating, complex machine. It makes us think how we do, to feel how we do, and behave as we do. Okay, would you like to come for any, John? I scanned 41 murderers. I compared them to 41 non-murderers, and I found part of the brain that were different in the murderers, part of that were involved in different things like impulse control, emotion regulation, fear, morality. Hello, John, it's Adrian here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. What we're going to do now is a scan looking at different parts of your brain. Maybe there's going to be something different about your brain compared to the average person. I've never ever thought that how my brain works is any different from anybody else's. It was more the quiet, reserved type, until it kicked off, and then I become like something I didn't even recognise. Yeah. How would you describe that person? Fucking dangerous. <laughs> As the images of John's brain come through, Adrian detects a problem that's so clear he can see it with the naked eye. We do see a couple of interesting areas right now, even just visually looking at your brain. There's a part of the temporal cortex, the middle part of the temporal cortex, that we call the amygdala. The amygdala is the seat of emotion. It's part of our fight or flight reaction. And even a small reduction in tissue can make an enormous difference to behavior. It's a bit of a circle there. I don't know if you can pick that up. Yeah, Sissy. I see that. What do you see there? Well, this shadowy part is a lot larger than the other side. Yep. Yeah. We think that there's a little bit of shrinkage. This part of the brain is really crucial for emotion, like um, fear, for example. The amygdala on one side of John's brain is much smaller than the other. This can result in a lack of fear, which is a major risk factor for crime and violence. If the amygdala is shrunken, you become a fearless individual. In John's life, 
that's of significance. You know, sticking a gun in someone's chest. You've got to have a certain lack of fear and guts and chutzpah, so to speak, to be able to do something like that. The amazing thing is, is that shrunken amygdalas are also found in psychopaths. And I think that's something that we need to probe into further. Kind of living a normal life. Got my own little flat. Nobody bothers me. Like the single cell I had for 43 years, you just go and lock yourself up, and that's your private space. Convicted murderer John Massey was released from prison last year after being kept behind bars for 43 years. Now he's out, age 71, he's starting life again. I got my favourite uh, piece of kit is that slow cooker. I chop everything up, put a bit of gravy in it, and just forget about it. Keeps, keeps all the flavours locked in. I've got everything I need here, really. During his time inside, John escaped on three separate occasions. But with every prison break, his sentence was extended. They didn't allow me to go to one funeral. Even the Cray twins went to a funeral. So I'm now worse than the Crays. More dangerous than the craze. Absolute bullshit. So I made my own way. In 2012, at the age of 64, John broke out of Pentonville, one of Britain's toughest prisons, by descending its 25-foot perimeter wall. My mother contracted a brain tumour and I got to see my mum. And no bastard on this earth can ever take that away from me. Fuck them. John is now undergoing an investigation to find hidden traits that may have driven his behavior and predisposed him to commit murder. What we're looking for is how biological factors stack up with psychological and social factors to create a toxic mix. Professor Adrian Rain has already discovered a problem with John's amygdala, a part of the brain responsible for feeling fear. Now he's had the scan converted to a 3D model so he can compare the volume of each region of John's brain to the average person. It's taken us days to churn out the data we use a supercomputer. So right down to the cubic millimeter, we can visualize the brain. And the new model has revealed another abnormality. What I'm interested in here is an area called the striatum. It makes up the reward system in the brain. When we're anticipating rewards, the striatum is the part of the brain that gets activated. It controls rewards and it drives us to rewards. So what did you find on the striatum? Well, compared to an average group of individuals, the volume of his is actually in the top 1%. Wow. His striatum is enlarged in size. An enlarged striatum seeking out rewards. Mm. So could these two risk factors, the enlarged striatum and the shrunken amygdala, have predisposed his behavior before the murder to create an individual who's lacking fear and taking big risks to get big rewards? Based on everything that we've talked about today, I think it would be really useful for me to probe further with John to understand what his reward-seeking behavior looked like and what were the sorts of environments that were shaping some of his responses. We're all born with certain traits, but the appropriate environmental conditions need to be in place to allow those traits to be expressed to their fullest. For John, I'm wondering what that environment looked like for him.
I'd like to go back further now to the years that were leading up to the murder. Were you working? Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more around that? Uh, well, I guess it all started off with uh, people uh, noticing my prowess as a driver. So I was invited on a bit of work. OK. And how old, roughly, were you, sort of, at the time? I think I was in my 20s then. In your 20s, yeah. And what were you doing? Robin Banks. You, you weren't out to hurt anybody or ruin anyone's day. You just had to grab that prize. And you virtually had to assume that that guard walking along the pavement with all that money was your money. What's he doing holding my money? How did you kind of plan for what you were doing? There virtually were no plans. You just get in the car, cruise along till you saw a van pull up at a bank, and you get out and have it immediately. Did you feel worried or concerned, or was it just sort of fearless and almost being in the zone? Yeah. You're cold, calculating, you know exactly what you've got to do, and you get the job done. John was in total control during those times. He had a gun, he was in a position of dominance. When you're getting away with that behaviour, when the rewards are big, you take increasingly dangerous risks to seek those rewards. Would you say, sort of, as you became more confident, as you and your partner were working better together, you, the well, jobs became we riskier? We, we felt we could literally tackle any job, no matter how many guards were there or public or whatever. You were never caught? No, we came pretty close to it. And we did get stopped by a squad car one day. They pulled up right beside us. So we hijacked the squad car. And then the radio burst into life. All units, all units. Tango 4 has just been hijacked by two bearded gunmen. We leave headed towards Canning Town. We came to a roundabout then, and I think Canning Town was that way. Oh, well, thank you very much. We went that way. Got to the point where I had the Aston Martin, the boat, the house. We just didn't know where to stuff the money. Uh, it was just so much of it. It was here, there, everywhere. Because um, it was hardly advisable to use a bank. I only kind of made withdrawals rather than deposits. It was a very continuous run of offending for him. He describes no fear. He describes his adrenaline pumping. He describes risk-taking behaviours. So, in terms of trying to explain what got John onto that criminal, reward-seeking way of life, you can point the finger, can't you, at the striatum. We see that John's reward-seeking behaviour has spanned his entire life. We can also see how it played into his behaviour on the night of the murder. If somebody has wronged you, you might seek revenge and there's no greater reward than revenge. In the UK, there's over 8,500 prisoners serving life sentences for violent crime and murder. That's a higher proportion of the total prison population than in any other European country or even America. But science is now offering new insight into why people kill, and it's questioning how responsible they may be for their crimes. We think we have free will, but actually we are machines which have been programmed really early on in life. Half of that programming comes from the genes we are born with, and the other half comes from the environment. And it's the interaction between these two processes where the unique version of us is made. 
So when it comes to murderers, the question is how much effect did these factors have on their behavior and the crime that they committed? Over the past 10 days, Adrian and Vicky have been investigating convicted murderer, John Massey. And their tests have already revealed a predisposition to fearlessness and reward-seeking behavior. Oh, you really got good brains. Junkies dreams now. <laughs> now, Adrian wants to analyze John's DNA to look for risk factors for violence in his genetic makeup from before he was even born. When we think about genes, we think about things like eye color or height. But genes can affect our chemical makeup, and that will affect our brain functioning, which in turn affects how we think, how we feel. So when one of those genes is abnormal, it can have a big effect on behavior. We checked into John's DNA. And one of the findings that we have here is to do with the serotonin transporter gene. There's two versions of this gene, and John has a version that results in low serotonin, which is associated with blunted stress responsivity. If you're a racing car driver, that can be very adaptive. You need a lack of fear and anxiety and stress to make the right decisions. But if you're somebody like John, and if you're in a criminal environment, and you're already lacking in fear, then this lack of stress can make you a very dangerous person. But some genes can lie dormant from birth until they're activated by factors in the outside world. Research studies have shown that bad childhood experiences like neglect or abuse can activate genes. So it's the genes that load the gun and the environment that pulls the trigger. Question is, was that gene functioning as it is at his birth and onwards, or was that gene turned on by the environment? So it would be really useful to find out whether there were any stressors that were present in John's childhood and early formative years. Would it be OK if we go back to, is it 1948 when you were born? Is that correct? Yeah. What was life like? My earliest memory is when I was three. Three? I can't go back any further than that. What is it that you remember at the age of three? It was my mum taking me to the first children's home. And being set up to ride this red tricycle around the garden. By the time I've completed the circuit, my mum had gone. Do you recall how you felt in that moment? Yeah, I screamed like a blue murder. Mm. Uh, they dragged me into the house. I wanted to run down the road and find my mum. How did you feel, sort of, whilst you were there? I resented every minute of it. I can't recall any happy times there. Do you remember why your mum felt that she had to take you to the children's home? No, I never ever did find that for the whole of my life. The first five years of a child's life are absolutely critical. Research tells us that early maternal abandonment can have an effect on the way in which people experience emotions. But we now also know that maternal abandonment can turn on and off certain genes. John was in children's homes throughout his entire childhood. Vicky is taking him back to the first one he can remember. Nearly a quarter of all prisoners have been in a care home at some point during their childhood. By going back to those locations where 
some of John's early memories were formed. I'm hoping to establish the links between those experiences that he had as a child and his subsequent adult behaviour. So it should be just ran past the pier. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, it was something like that house there, but either side there used to be a gate. Is there? Yes. That's it. That's it, it's over there. That's it. Yep. That's you see it? Fucking that that is it. That's it. Oh. Oh. Any of this? See, that's a new build. Mm. But I'm sure that was a classroom there. Yeah. What do you remember about being in those classrooms? Strict. I remember um, sitting in the window waiting for your mum who never arrives. I'm wondering when if you're ever going to see him again. But even though she left me there, she still loved me. It must have been as traumatic for her as it was for me. I imagine on the journey home, she was crying. Yeah. Yeah, I miss my old mum. No one loves you like your mum. And they don't care who you are. Right. How are you feeling? Tense. Because I don't normally vocalise these things, you know. No, uh, I feel really they've been grateful that you're bottled up for, for years and years. Yeah. And it, I feel, I feel like I want to burst into tears. Oh, bless you. You've had some really difficult experiences. Well, and that's where I get my passion and anger and all that from. Sometimes I can't control it, it's so fierce. And uh, I'm hoping maybe that somehow this is going to purge me of all that um, anger and sadness, you know. John's experience of abandonment may have activated the gene that blunts stress. But Vicky believes it could also have disrupted the development of his personality. When a child experiences abandonment, it can affect their sense of safety and security. This leads to them numbing down their emotions because emotions mean pain. But this numbing can lead to a change in structure in the developing brain which significantly increases the risk of developing a psychopathic personality. Taking together the findings we've got, the genetic factors, the early biological factors, combining them together with the neglect, the abandonment, can create a psychopath. A psychopathic personality would be another risk factor that may help to explain John's behavior on the night of the murder. Psychopathy is a personality disorder that's characterized by a lack of feeling for other people, a lack of empathy, a lack of remorse, a lack of guilt. Let's think of John's behavior on that night. He was showing rather callous, psychopathic-like behavior, sticking that gun into the bouncer's chest and then later stepping over the dead body and shooting up the club. We know that about 1% of the general population have a psychopathic personality, but in murderers, that base rate is 25%. I think we're getting more and more clues about a potential emotional impairment in John. I think that's what I need to focus on in my next step, in trying to understand what led John to murder that night. To 
further investigate if John is psychopathic, Adrian is going to rescan the region of his brain that experiences empathy. He's enlisted the help of King's College London, experts in this area of research. We find that psychopathic-like individuals are poor at recognizing emotion in faces. What's John like? While inside the MRI scanner, John will be shown a series of faces that each show a different emotion. We're just about to start with the scan, OK? This time, Adrian is assessing the function of a specific brain area called the insula, which processes feelings for other people. What John has been told is that he's simply got to press a response button when he sees a female face and another response button when he sees a male face. But implicitly, sort of covertly underneath that, what we're going to be doing here is looking to see his brain response to different facial emotions. If this region becomes engaged by the emotions on the faces John sees, any activity will be visible on the scanner. Our provisional hypothesis here is that when he was confronted with that bouncer on the door, he didn't really have that normal range of emotions of empathy and concern for other people, which would prevent him from pulling the trigger. Having analysed the scan data, forensic psychiatrist Dr Nigel Blackwood now has the results of how John's insula is functioning. So this is a model of John's brain. And when John looks at fearful faces, this area of the brain is not responding in the way it might in you or I. So our insula would become increasingly active the more fearful that face becomes. And that's not the case with John. What's the net effect of this reduction in functioning? So the insula is a key part of individuals' social brains, and it acts as a linking hub between the information we get from our bodies about our emotional states and social context. We use that sort of information to shape our behaviour. If I struggle to read that you're fearful or sad about something that I've done, and I'm, if I've got what I want as a result of that behaviour, those behaviours are likely to continue. Does this look like a psychopathic brain? It's certainly consistent with wider studies that we've conducted in that psychopathic group of men. So we have information from the brain data. I think one of the challenges is that we don't have John's brain at the time of the offence. We've got it well after the fact. But you put together the maltreatment and that negative home environment. You combine that with what we have behind me, reduced emotional brain functioning. You know what that's a recipe for? Psychopathy. In 1975, John Massey shot a pub bouncer and served 43 years for murder. See that view there, the sky? That's terrific. In prison, you couldn't even see the sky, especially in the segregation units. Professor Adrian Rain and Dr. Vicky Thakordis Desai have spent three weeks investigating John's brain genetic makeup and conducting forensic interviews. His aggression, his need for stimulation, all of those things really relate back to those early experiences. Together, they've identified a number of biological and psychological risk factors for crime and violence. From negative childhood experiences to a brain that's predisposed to lacking fear. I'm quite happy to explore this scientific approach because, to me, it all makes sense. We need people like Adrian and Vicky because they're like the, like the old pioneers of the old Wild West. You know, somebody's got to do it first. And who knows, can maybe create a better world. Now they're going to show John a timeline of the factors they've discovered and how they could have shaped his behaviour. 
From my perspective, it all starts off with genetics. You've got a variant of a gene which results in somebody not quite experiencing stress as other people do. This gene may have lain dormant until it was turned on by negative childhood experiences. You very vividly recall that moment that your mother left you in a children's home at the age of three. Yeah. All of those things affected your emotions and you shut down because it became painful. And that environmental experience can really be toxic to brain development. What's in white here is a structure called the insula, which is showing poorer functioning in your brain when you're processing emotional faces. And that results in you having a lack of feeling for other people. As John got older, Adrian believes another part of his brain influenced his behavior. The striatum is part of the brain that processes rewards. And actually, that part of your brain, John, is enlarged in size, which makes you want to seek rewards. In addition to the striatum, the amygdala was reduced in volume. So part of the brain involved in processing emotion, including fear, seemed down in you. And I think you seem to be really a pretty fearless individual. The final factor they have discovered may have shaped John's entire personality. Emotions are a bit different in you compared to other people. There is the areas of the brain that code for emotion processes seem down in you. The negative early development that you had, the neglect, all points to traits of a psychopathic personality. With John's risk factors now laid out, Adrian and Vicky can reveal their theory of how they combined to affect his behavior on the night of the murder and whether John was destined to kill. On that day, you went out, you were having a good time. Then you described how it became brawl and you threw that first punch. Yeah, I became a little bit Jekyll and Hyde, yeah. During the fight, an associate was badly injured, so John returned with a loaded gun. Adrian believes his actions were driven by biological risk factors in his brain. You had to be someone who was pretty fearless to go and do what you did, getting that gun, and it was partly driven by a brain that was always seeking rewards. And do you know what one of those rewards is? It's revenge. The other part of your brain that contributed to what happened on that night is a brain that is impaired in terms of empathy. If you have empathy, there's no way you're going to pick up a gun with the intention of hurting people because you'd feel very guilty about it. But your brain just doesn't function quite that way. And there's a lot of factors in a psychopathic personality that can lead you to doing what you did. Most important of all, lack of conscience, lack of remorse, lack of guilt. Upon reaching the door of the pub, John's reactions could have been driven by psychological factors and behavior learned from years robbing banks. You held a gun to the victim and unlike the bank tellers who froze, this was the first time you thought you were in the dominant position, but somebody came back at you, and that resulted in yeah. the gun being fired. Uh -huh. So what made you a murderer, John? It's a combination of all of these factors together, biological, psychological, and social. All of these things can shape who we are. Yeah, it was just the wrong combination that evening. which I obviously thoroughly regret. And I've got a lot of 
sympathy with his family. If we could have gone back and helped John, age three, and given him the love, the acknowledgement, and the attention that he would have needed at that time, maybe we wouldn't be talking about John as a psychopathic murderer. We have medications that can alter neurotransmitter functioning. We have therapy that can bring on board emotions that aren't really there. Perhaps in the future, we may be able to identify people with the risk factors that John had and do something to help. We kind of spot on, really, I guess. I'm not so sure about the, the psychopathic bits, but um, for a three-year-old, as I was at the time, all you know is that you've, you've been abandoned. The child's got to feel wanted and loved and safe. Take away any one of those factors, that child's going to suffer. And as we know now, it's going to have an impact upon the rest of their life.